Out of the pages of prophecy rise the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Since they first appeared in vision to the Apostle John, they've haunted the imagination of mankind. Who are they? And what is the meaning of the terrifying ride? This week on The Will Tomorrow, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. This week on The World Tomorrow, David Hume. Nearly 1,900 years ago, a lonely old man was sent into exile. His prison, the tiny Greek island of Patmos. Little did he know he was about to experience one of the most chilling scenarios anyone has ever seen. In vision, he was given a series of astonishing prophecies. The man's name was John, the last remaining apostle of Jesus Christ. He recorded what he saw, and it became the last book of the Bible. It's called the Apocalypse, or Book of Revelation. Typifying the times we're now entering, John sat down in writing one of the Bible's most enduring images, the legendary Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The prophecies are filled with mysterious symbols, foreboding creatures, and frightening events. But the message was not primarily for John's day, but for another generation, one that would live at the time of the greatest danger to mankind. Using the language of his day, John described as well as he could what he saw of the future. Ever since, scholars and laymen alike have wondered what the four horsemen represent. There's been much speculation, but not until our modern age have the answers been found, because there are keys that unlock the real understanding of these strange horses and their terrifying riders. We begin with the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, as the four horsemen of the apocalypse start their mysterious ride across the earth. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I looked. And behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. When he opened the fourth seal, I looked. And behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Just what do these terrifying symbols mean? Do they tell us anything for today? Are they just part of a bad dream? Or do they perhaps represent a sequence of devastating events yet to happen? These questions we'll be answering on today's program. Strange as it may sound, these four startling horsemen symbolize what will probably affect the future of most of us alive today. In our sophisticated age, some have hastily dismissed this very important book of Revelation as the delusions of a religious fanatic, 
the confused scribblings of a senile apostle. Even Protestant reformer John Calvin excluded the book from his New Testament commentary. And Martin Luther later declared the apocalypse to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. He said everyone thinks of the book whatever his spirit suggests. Well, what about it? Are the book of Revelation and its symbols worth the time of day in the 20th century? The first verse of the book says this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. And let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a revelation, a revealing, not a concealing of things. It's a revealing of events. The word apocalypse comes from a Greek word meaning to uncover or to reveal. According to Christ, these visions were written to give understanding so that we can know what the future will hold. The book of Revelation is concerned with the time of God's dramatic intervention in human affairs just before the return of Jesus Christ. To understand the four horsemen, we need to pick up the story flow in chapter 5. Here in vision, John sees God the Father on his throne in heaven. We read this in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. But as we read in the next few verses, no one could be found to break the seals and open up this incredibly important document. In the vision, John was upset. In verse 4, he says this, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Verse 5 says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. This being called the Lamb throughout the book of Revelation is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Now we come to chapter 6, which is the crucial and pivotal chapter of the entire book. In this chapter, Jesus Christ breaks six of the seven seals concealing the future of mankind. John watches as one by one the seals are broken and the meaning of the scroll is revealed. What does John see first? And I look, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bone, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. What could this white horseman with bow and crown represent? And what or who is he trying to conquer? Remember, whatever we're seeing here has relevance for our time now. Some Bible scholars lean to the conclusion that this is speaking of Christ himself. And certainly this horseman does bear a similarity to Christ. But Christ has not been conquering nations by force, symbolized by the bow. And anyway, the white horse and its rider appear in the story flow of this book before Christ returns, so they can't symbolize Jesus Christ. How then do we come to an understanding? Here's the key. The prophecies of Revelation are an expansion of a famous prophecy Jesus gave to his disciples shortly before his crucifixion. It's known as the Olivet Prophecy because the discussion took place on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. You can find the details in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Jesus' disciples came to him and asked him the same question the book of Revelation addresses. They wanted to know what conditions would precede his second coming. He answered them by summarizing the key events. When that Olivet prophecy and the book of Revelation are read side by side, the outline of future events becomes clear. Notice this from Matthew's account, Matthew 24, verses 3 through 5. Now, as he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. In other words, Christ prophesied that false religious leaders would be the first in a series of conditions leading up to his second coming. 
Religious figures teaching counterfeit religion have indeed deceived many. They will deceive many more before Christ's return. This worldwide religion masquerading as Christianity will look like Christianity but be a fake. We can see that clearly from present conditions in the world and from Christ's own words to his disciples. The white horse and its rider highlight a final false Christ and false religion resorting to military might to conquer and subjugate peoples and nations. The lesson from history is clear. When counterfeit religion possesses the bow, symbolic of military power, it uses armies and weapons to achieve its end of forced conversion. According to this book, we're going to experience that again with greater intensity in the years ahead. What's the next worldwide condition to notice? Following on the heels of the white horse comes another frightening specter as the second seal is broken. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Another shocking image. But this time, the message is war. Brandishing a great sword, the red horseman takes peace from the earth and causes man to kill fellow man. Isn't that what we're experiencing more and more? Notice how clearly this second horseman corresponds with Christ's second sign in Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The Bible is consistent if we let it speak for itself, and don't force our own interpretations on it. The meaning of the red horse is very obviously a world torn by wars. <laughs> Ever since mankind has been on earth, there's been violence. In this century, we've witnessed two world wars so terrible that people call each one the war to end all wars. They weren't, of course. Try as he might, mankind has never learned how to settle its differences peacefully. And all the while, the technology of war has been advancing. It's been so rapid that we've entered a time when the utter destructiveness of war has brought us to the brink of global annihilation. Almost 1900 years ago, this book predicted there would be a time when the world would be convulsed by many battles. At the end of 1987, more wars were being fought than in any previous time. We're on the edge of a time of world war that could end civilization itself. Jesus Christ knew that even limited nuclear wars would not bring humans to their senses. He put it this way in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world at this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And so the terrible red horse and its violent rider picture what we know only too well, that we live in an era of ultimate weapons destined for use. Now what happens next? Well, we'll discover that in a moment. But first, I'd like to offer you this free booklet, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. It explains today's subject in much greater detail. Chapter 1 shows how Christ himself revealed the meaning of the four mysterious riders for our day. Chapter 2 uncovers the identity of the white horse's rider and explains why false religion is so dangerous. Chapter 3 shows in vivid detail why war is symbolized by the rider of the red horse and how his ride will continue in our time. The remaining chapters explain the symbols of the third and fourth horses and their riders. 
All of this may have great impact on your life in the years ahead, and you need to know about it. So be sure and request The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Along with the booklet, if you're not already a subscriber, we'll be sending you a sample copy of the Plain Truth magazine. It analyzes world news in the light of Bible prophecy, along with other articles dealing with the family and social issues. I'll be offering this free literature again at the end of today's program. Now, John's account doesn't end with the white and red horses. Close behind them comes yet another. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a penny, and three quarts of barley for a penny. And do not harm the oil and the wine. The black horse, the symbol of famine. Coming hard on the hoofbeats of the red horse of war, we have the effects of acute food deprivation. This is just as Christ said. Notice Luke 21, the beginning of verse 11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines. What's the effect of revolutions and wars on survivors? Even though the fighting may stop, the land is ravaged and food shortage and famine are the result. It happened in Europe after the last world war, in Cambodia a decade ago, and it's happening in Ethiopia and Mozambique even today. War wreaks havoc on agriculture. And there's every reason to believe that a nuclear war would eventually cause global disaster. Many scientists confirm that the side effects of such a war would cause even more death than the immediate result of the blast. Firestorms would produce enormous clouds of smoke and dust, limiting the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth. Some have dubbed this phenomenon the nuclear winter. Its effects on agriculture and human life would be catastrophic. According to Cornell University scientist Mark Harwell, most of the world's population, as many as 4 billion people, could starve to death in a nuclear war rather than die of burns or radiation. Rather than reflecting images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a modern nuclear war would, for most people of the world, much more resemble current images of Ethiopia and the Sudan. So ironically, the death toll from famine could be even greater than from outright war. And that fact is in perfect agreement with the sequence of events recorded by John. And so this is the grim picture we see unfolding as the third horseman rides out of the pages of prophecy. Some nations, by carefully rationing their reserves, might survive. But for millions of others, there'll be no alternative but hunger and starvation. Jesus Christ warned of these consequences long before we recognize the awful potential of nuclear winter. You see, these horsemen of the apocalypse ride one after the other with a cumulative impact. The one compounds the effect of the other. So these three horses, symbolizing counterfeit Christianity, escalating warfare, and devastating famine, leave turmoil and suffering behind them. But tragically, there's one more horseman to come. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. This final awesome sight symbolizes sickness and death. At a point in the future, civilization will break down, 
from the combined crushing impact of all four horsemen. It'll be every one for him or herself. Jesus himself said pestilences or disease epidemics would be part of these world-devastating events. And so it seems even nature itself turns against humanity as wild animals further ravage the weakened, hungry population. Epidemics carried by animals may even be a factor in the death of many for whom no medical care will be available. When we let the Bible interpret its own symbols, we see these horsemen represent trends that occur throughout history but they greatly intensify in the years just before Jesus Christ returned to this earth. The four horsemen foretell a time of unparalleled horror facing civilization. It's a frightening picture, and these are not things we prefer to think about. The book of Revelation seems totally negative, but it is very real. It's the world we live in, and we need to wake up and understand where it's heading. What we have to realize is that world events are all moving to a conclusion. Where will you be when all these things begin to coincide? Jesus said that some people would be so terrified by world events that they'd die from fear. Notice Luke 21 and verse 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. But what about you? Will you be spared? Will you survive? Well, there's much, much more to the apocalypse than these prophecies in the first few chapters. Despite all we've seen, the book has a powerful and encouraging conclusion. Humanity does win in the end, but not before terrible lessons have been learned. Remember, the apocalypse, or book of Revelation, and the outline of prophecy in Matthew 24 have one central theme in common, the coming of the kingdom of God to this earth the restoration of wise, just government under Christ's rule. A better world is coming, a kinder, gentler, peaceful world, where people will live without fear of destruction. So here in the Bible, written in advance, are the major events leading up to the very end of man's present civilization and the beginning of tomorrow's world. This is a book for our time. When John first saw these things, their final fulfillment was a great way off but now we're much closer, and they'll likely happen in the lifetime of most of us. To understand, you need to know more, and you need to know what to do to prepare for these earth-shattering events. This same book that foretells the coming of the four horsemen also shows how to be protected from what's ahead. Here are Christ's own words about that protection. They're recorded in Luke chapter 21 and verse 36. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Christ promised protection for those who heed the warning, stay alert, change their lives, and start making right choices. This era of man's civilization has almost run its course. The heartbreak and uncertainty, the cruelty, ruthlessness, and suffering will come to an end. But before they do, the four horsemen complete their ride. To help you understand world conditions and these startling biblical images, we'd like to offer you this week's free literature, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and The Point Truth Magazine. We hope to see you again next week. Till then, thanks for joining us. I'm David Hume for The World Tomorrow. The preceding program and all literature were produced and sponsored by the Worldwide Church of God.